Blood Brothers Podcast, a Five Pillars Production. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, my dear brothers, sisters, friends, and the foes out there, and welcome to another episode of the Blood Brothers Podcast with your host, Didi Hussein. I want to remind all the avid podcast listeners to subscribe to our channels on all the major audio platforms, and of course, if you're watching this via YouTube, subscribe, like, and share this video. Today's guest is someone who, when I, before we started filming, said, describe yourself, I'm a bit like Marmite, and he's someone whose work I have been following quite recently and there's lots to be spoken about in that regard and that's none other than brother Mahdi Tijani. Pleasure to be here. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum as wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. What's going on my bro? Alhamdulillah. Looking forward to this conversation inshallah. Likewise, but there's two things I have to quickly get out of the way. Yes. The shoe colour, do they come as a pair? No. So you've mixed it? Yes. Ah, you flex it quite well. <laughs> exactly. And have you been told by people who have met you in person that they didn't think that you were as tall as you are? All the time. So what is your height at the moment? 6'3", but six. in these Tims, I'm 6'4", six 6'4 four, six four yeah. But I think when man see your videos, they only seen that upper body. Yeah. They're yeah. not seeing them, them, them long legs. The long legs, yeah. Mashallah, mashallah. What's been happening, bro? Alhamdulillah, akhi. I'm looking forward to uh, a very interesting discussion, especially off the back of the, uh, the Twitter fest, mashallah. Of course, of course. You know, I first watched your videos about three months ago. I think maybe Ramadan, just before Ramadan. I don't know what I was searching on YouTube, but your videos came up. Okay, and that's good. I, and, I, and, I, and I watched some of the videos. Mm. But when I told a few people, when I asked a few people about Mahdi Tijani, at least three people said to me, oh, the Muslim red pill guy. Why does that uh, label attribute to? Why is it attribute to? I think for a while, my Instagram handle was the red Mahdi. Oh, so yes. I think it's... it's from that, my, my Instagram handle is the Mahdi Tijani now. Um, but there are a lot of red pill realities that I have a debt of gratitude for, for having learnt it from the non-Muslims in the red pill space, you see. So uh, I can't turn around and say, oh no, I've got no affinity to them. Or, no, I benefited greatly from a lot of their work from some of the content creators in that space. Some of them who've been there for a very long time, we're talking decades. So, and the whole term red pill, where does it come from in the first place? It's a matrix terminology, you know? Red pill, blue pill. Red pill, blue pill, blue pill, continue with your uh, fake existence. Mm. Red pill, I'll show you how deep the rabbit hole goes mm -hmm. and give you the realities of what is actually going on in the world. And with regards to this discussion, that is women, mm -hmm. specifically in a relationship dynamic. Mm -hmm. what, so when you chose your Instagram handle to be the Red Mahdi, was that red associated to the red pill? Yes, it was, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't want to delve in too much to conversations that you've already had in the past, mm. uh, namely with uh, Muhammad Hijab and uh, Gabriel Romani, um, about, you know, those from the red pill movement or community that have held positions uh, or moral positions whereby Islam has something to say about this area. So I don't want to go in too much into that. Yeah. But I, what I will ask you is, what is it that you've benefited from that your religion could not give to you? No, oof, we have to be careful how we say that, okay? It is not a, a, a deficiency or a lack on the part of the religion just because we have taken some knowledge from somewhere else. I say this on my podcast over and over. Islam does not have a monopoly on general knowledge. Your background is in politics, right? Politics and journalism. You didn't learn politics and journalism from the Quran or the books of Hadith. No, but I've got uh, I got a particular framework from there, though. You've got your framework from there, but I'm sure when you did your degree, for example, there would have been certain books that you had to go through and memorize the material. The from vast that. majority were not the Quran and Sunnah. Barakallah, If you wanted to become a, a brain surgeon tomorrow, the va nothing's in the Quran. You're and not Sunnah gonna learn. You are not gonna trust me to perform brain surgery on your father. Mm. Just because I said to you, I, I'm a hafid of the Qur'an. So you can take general knowledge, beneficial, al-munnafa, from wherever it comes from. And this is not a slight on the religion. The, the Qur'an is hidayah, it's guidance. Wicked. So are, you, are we then saying that the knowledge that you did take or benefit from, from the red pill space community movement were not things that Islam had a say in? Yes. So for example, <clears throat> okay. The concept of alpha widows, 
What is an alpha widow? An alpha widow is a woman who was with a man whom she deemed perceived to be alpha. The reality is irrelevant whether he was or wasn't. It's her perception. For whatever reason, they went their separate ways. Maybe she left him, maybe he left her. But he has forever imprinted himself upon her. And no matter which other man she moves on in the next relationship or the one after or the one after that, she has still got in the back of her mind that experience with that man. And every other man thereafter is simply compared to him. He is the measuring stick by which she uses to see whether other men meet this standard or not. And usually she, over, she blows over this image in her mind. You know, because she feeds it so much attention, it actually bec he becomes more than what he really was. And by extension, no man will ever be able to live up to that because now this is not even a reality. Even if that alpha ex-husband of hers could have been oppressive. Even if, especially, have you ever heard of the term trauma bond? Of course. There can be trauma bonds there. So let's say he was oppressive and he put her on this emotional roller coaster, something which, by the way, women are addicted to. Why do women love watching dramas? The Kardashians, it's just drama. The women love it. So he puts her on this emotional roller coaster, up, down, left, right, bismillah, mashallah. And then she misses it once she gets with the proverbial nice guy who is doing everything he's been told to do. Be nice, secure, stable. The only problem is it's boring. There is no woman who watches a boring drama. She wants to really you know toxic dramas where's your uh, ancestral origin my father is algerian and my mother's english okay so let's talk about the algerian side and let's talk about my bangladeshi side yeah, yeah. so our grandmothers great grandmothers even our mothers maybe if they were women from the old country as they say yeah you telling me that even the women of those civilizations and backgrounds also want the drama it's a spectrum Okay, so there is, there, it's not a one-size-fits-all approach. Some women want it more than others. Some want more stability than others. But all of them have an affinity to a little bit of a roller coaster in the minimum. They want a little bit of excitement, yani, shwe, yeah, unpredictability. Don't be too predictable. Others, they're just toxic, outright toxic. Their one sister, how she said it to me, actually, to quote her verbatim was, she said to me, I want to marry a toxic man. I said to her, why? She said, because that's all I've ever been used to from seeing my mother with my father. Why would I want anything different? These were her words. Why would I want anything different? This is what I'm used to. So it's a spectrum and a scale. You know, in many of your conversations and podcasts that you've been on, uh, the three Muslims, your conversation with hijab and other things, um, I'm saying this for the benefit of our viewers and listeners. Many times researches or, 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 or positions are stated by yourself. Are you backing that with actual data and research? Or is this something based on your limited observations and experience? With regards to what specifically? That, for example, you just said that women like a certain level of drama or women love a certain level of drama. Mm. You said that as a statement of fact or it appeared as a statement of fact. For that to be a statement of fact, there'd have to be some qualitative and quantitative data to suggest that, yes, this is something that women want or don't I want. I understand. I've never heard of a researcher who's gone out of his way to research this to see whether women are addicted to drama or not. But we can judge by uh, eyeballs on the Kardashians okay. and such type of programs that women, generally speaking, have an affinity to this type of drama. We've even got a term for it. We call it outrage porn. If you have a look at the comments on that most recent post that went viral on my page, mm. it's all women. There's a few men there. But it's, it's all women. They are addicted to the drama. It's conversation. And you, because most people's lives are boring, well, I've got to find my drama fixed from somewhere. Okay. And if it just so happens to be Mahdi today, then so be it. Okay, so let's, let's, let's quickly just, just wrap up on this red pill stuff, right? Yeah. Sure. Tell me about some of the concepts or positions which you've benefited from that you have said have helped you. And when I said to you, oh, was, was there some shortcoming in your video? Let's let me be careful. Okay, fine. Let me, what I meant by that was, were there things that you took from the red pill community, mm. ideology, movement, whatever you want to call it, that Islam also had things to say about Perhaps, those Perhaps, yes. Okay, let me give you an example. Women are, are hypergamous by nature. This is not a red pill thing. This is just a well-known thing, right? Hypergamy meaning women want their superior. She wants a man taller than her, stronger than her, 
preferably richer than her and more intelligent than her. You never heard a woman say, I want a man who's weaker than me and dumber than me. You just didn't hear that, right? She's looking for her superior. So with that being the case then. Broski, let me just quickly cut in there. Sure. There'll be sisters out there, there'll be women out there that would want that second category of man dumber than her, thicker than her, might not, might, richer than her is cool, but everything else, <laughs> yeah. so she can control him. But yeah, you're, you're right. So she, can, so, 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 she, she has, so she has an easy life of domination and control and not being... For this, we would say that the exception to the rule merely pr proves the rule. Really? Yeah, of course, because this is an exception. This, if there are women like this who exist, which I'm sure there are, because they prioritize control, and we can get to that afterwards with yesterday's video, they prioritize control over... Uh, her natural fitra, right? We can get to that. But they are the exception as opposed to the rule. Okay, generally speaking, a woman wants her superior. <laughs> she, she doesn't want someone who is inferior to her on most metrics. It's not something she can show off about because women use men as, as social status symbols. Look at my husband, you see? Mm -hmm. So with that being the case then, if you put yourself in a position whereby you are proving your worth to her, you have flipped these dynamics and what you are subcommunicating to her is you are superior to me, therefore I must prove myself to you. Just in the same way, if you were an employer and I'm coming to you to apply for a job, I would need to impress you. Okay, you're my employer, I must impress you. In this instance here, she's the employer or you've put her on that pedestal and now you are making yourself or conducting yourself in a way where you feel you must prove yourself to her. And in the back of her mind, she's thinking, but if this guy was the one, why is he having to prove himself to me? Surely I should have to prove myself to him. I have to explain this guy to my dad, though. How do you mean? Because if this guy impresses me, I have to now take those accolades and convey it to my father to make him someone who's suitable for my hand. No problem. In I remember when I talk, I'm talking, I can't speak for Maghrebis, I can't speak for Turks, Arabs, mm. Kurds, West Africans. I can speak for Desis. Yeah. I can speak from my experience from Bangladeshi, Pakistani, and maybe a bit of the Gujarati Indian community. Sometimes the man them have to prove themselves. No problem in, for example, saying she says to you, uh, what's your level of education you tell her this Bro, is my level of education let me see, a common one amongst bangladeshis yeah yeah job salary university education and any aspirations to become a proprietor adi adi this is fine that's not what i'm referring to so what are you saying <laughs> to become a proprietor what what i'm referring to is the repeated need to prove yourself to her Habibti, can I take you here? Can I take, can we go there? What would you like to do? Oh, you were late by half an hour, no problem, inshallah. Oh, you cancelled? Not a problem, we can do it tomorrow. You are constantly on her time. Do you mm. see? So I'm not saying, you, you, of course, you need to show a father. You're, you're a father to a daughter, I'm a father to a daughter. You need to show, Yani, what are you bringing to the table, young man, you know? Mm. Well, what have you got to offer? So you're not talking about that? I'm not talking about that. I'm saying the repeated need to prove yourself to her time and time again. This is where it becomes a problem and this is where she starts to question your worth in her eyes for if, if we use the employer and employee uh, example again, well, if she's looking for her superior, then you should be in the employer position. You are actually looking to employ a wife as opposed to her looking to employ a husband. Why does it have to be like that? Because she's hypergamous. But why does it have to be like an employment employment thing? Let's not get too fixated on those terms. That was just an, an, an analogy to try and make sense of it. What I'm saying is, if it, why does it have to be like that? You would have to ask the woman, why do you need someone who is superior to you? Which I believe, by the way, that this is the normal state of affairs. This is not abnormal. This is not something women should be reprimanded for. This is not something they should be mocked for. This is normal. But to ask that question is akin to saying what I just said, well, uh, sister or woman, why? Do you, why do you need your a superior? Why can't you marry someone who is less intelligent than you, who is weaker than you? You can bench press 50, 40 kilos. What's wrong with him bench pressing 15 kilos? Why can't you go downstairs if you hear a knock on the door in the middle of the night? Why does it have to be him? How far do we take the discussion? Okay, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is, or ask you is, the framing of certain realities, hmm. right? Um, it is the conclusive style in which you discuss these things mm. which seem definitive Yanni like I ex even if I was to accept that 70% or 80% or even 90% of women and by the way are we talking Muslim women or women in general it's women in general it's not a Muslim thing why not because it's not 
Well, oh. Women are hypergamous across the board. Okay, but at, at the very least, Islam would help contain and channel that Beautiful. in a manner in which is not haram. Beautiful statement. In a statement. manner which is not oppressive. Beautiful statement. Islam does fetter hypergamy when it is practiced properly. In fact, Islam fetters everyone. Point blank, period. Okay, what is one problem that a lot of uh, other content creators have taken with me in this space is, you know, this whole red pill stuff, it promotes sleeping with many women. In fact, some content creators, big content creators will say, sleep with a minimum of 50 women before consi you consider getting married. And their rationale is, after you've been through 50 women, you'll have a good idea of a, a woman's nature, not realizing that there's a contradiction here, which is you are contributing to the cancer mm. of women women with high body counts and we can get to that afterwards right so i'm sorry i've lost my trail of thought what no we, we, were, we were talking about how we conclusively talk about something I and mean, when we spoke about it being a muslim or non-muslim issue you said women generally and i said to you but surely islam at the very least would have yes. a way in which it manages sets out guidelines and parameters to how these things should be managed yes everyone needs fettering we should all be fettered so this example here i gave you sleep with a minimum 50 throw it against the wall we don't accept this as muslims you see take the i understand what they're saying it's like basically it's training you're going through training i get it I, it sounds logical right throw it against the wall because the religion doesn't accept it Khalas, we don't accept it mm -hmm. and then and in that way the religion fetters you you see you look at the andrew tates of the world who have you know been trending a lot online recently they don't individuals like him they don't realize the contradiction that they are living, which is on the one hand, we lambast and criticize women who are sleeping freely. But on the other hand, we don't mind contributing to that cancer. Absolutely. And this is where Islam comes in and fetters us, 100%. which is what we need. And that divine guidance, that fettering is what we need. Have you ever experienced uh, moments whilst looking into or researching or reading into the Red Pill world and your own Islamic standpoints? Have you ever found a contradiction? The one I just mentioned to you. But have you ever found a time where you've grappled with something that appears so true from the red pill observational point of view, mm. but Islam has either prohibited it or proposed something? No. Uh, opposite? No. No. So you've never had a crisis where... It's the not. The two are not connected. Like, as I said to you, if I wanted to become a neurosurgeon, I have to learn everything from the neurosurgeon people in, in the universities. Uh, I, it's, what's the likelihood I'm going to learn something there that's going to be in contradiction with the religion? Maybe if I have to get like an animal part and put it in the brain or something, I don't know how neurosurgery works, right? No, but, but surely within, and I'm, Allah, I'm, I'm saying this from my own very limited understanding of what red pill beliefs values are. And one mm. could argue, well, did you should have a bit of research? Well, yes or no, I want to hear it from you. Yeah. Surely there must be positions, especially if you're talking about relationships, marriage, mm. women, sex, if you're talking about, if, if the Red Pill community is talking about these things and has established positions or interpretations of these things, then surely they, it would come into a contradiction with Islam at some point. I'll give you an example. Okay, we can go, we can go there. Uh, in the whole Red Pill thing, they'll say to you, uh, don't marry single mums or don't get with single mums, period. The single mums are for, um, what's the word they use? I can't remember. Basically, just have fun. Okay. But now, how do we balance that as Muslims with the religion? in that okay you're going to say don't marry single mums and i understand the the baggage that and i use that word very carefully because it is baggage that comes along with dealing with single mums but we can't say don't marry single mums period what are they going to do commit zina so if it's sta statements like this that you are referring to yes we throw them against the wall and we find solutions for them you see and there are solutions for them and that's where we can go down the whole no strings the cat thing and we can talk about that later on as well when we spoke off camera when i first reached out to you uh, you said to me, he goes, Diddy, bruv, uh, just, just, you know, kind of update yourself with my recent positions and content, yeah. you know, cause some of my positions have changed, have evolved. And then I replied to you a couple of days ago saying, look, I don't really want to do that because I want to I hear it and learn it on camera. Yeah. So what positions of yours have evolved and why? Okay. So my stance on divorcee women or dealing with divorcee women has evolved for, to begin with. And for the main reason, the, it's the obvious one, which is, the religion, uh, Islam, has a solution to problems, okay? To simply say, don't deal with divorcee women, period, is not offering a solution. And actually, you're putting these sisters in a situation now whereby if everyone did implement this to the letter, 
what are they going to do? They're just going to commit zina. Okay? So, <clears throat> I am still of the uh, position that marrying a single mum is a lot more difficult de to deal with than marrying a sister who doesn't have children or indeed hasn't been married before. And there are obvious reasons for this, okay? To begin with, she has children from a previous marriage. Okay. You are most likely going to have all of the responsibility with regards to raising her children with very limited authority. Very limited authority. Because women are very, mothers are very protective over their children and all the more so when dealing with a strange man who is not their blood. Do you, if you marry a single mom, to, to those who are watching, how many single moms do you know who will allow you full authority over their children? Full authority, without her intervening, without her interrupt. So long as you're behaving just, of course, you're not oppressing the kids. But even then, the, some of them will tell you he's oppressed my children. And you find that he just shouted at them or he took their devices away for a day. You're going to have very limited authority in dealing with her children. Couple that with the fact that now it's a sunk cost investment. Every penny that you invest into those children is a... Uh, a sunk cost and other than you do it for the sake of Allah alhamdulillah yes, I'm Allah. telling you to me waste of money waste of money and let me explain to you why those children have no Islamic obligation to maintain any tie with you whatsoever when they grow up none at all and there's nothing you can say about this you can provide for a son, mashallah, for a, a child or children, mashallah, their whole lives, you put them through school. This is so common, by the way. You'd be surprised how common this story is. I put them through school, I paid for them, so on and so forth, and then she left me, and then she went off into the sunset with next man. And the children don't want nothing to do with me. So all I am simply saying to the brothers is, if, if you are going to get yourself in this type of situation, understand what you're getting yourself into. Understand the, 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 the pieces on the chessboard. And if you understand the pieces on the chessboard and you're happy with that, then Bismillah, tawakkul ala Allah. So this is a very important point because as you were saying that, two people that I know in my life came to thought, came to my mind. <clears throat> they married uh, single mothers. Sadly, one of, one of the relationships ended quite badly. Uh, another one, mashallah, is working very successfully. Alhamdulillah, the, Alhamdulillah, the children of that woman are very dutiful and loving of their uh, stepfather. Um, you know, they've had their own children as well. Things are going very well. In another example, it didn't go so well. Are you then saying that when you create content and videos and you give, you know, this kind of advice or red flag awareness, it's more to do with informing brothers that look, this is what you could be or are potentially getting into. If you know what you're getting into, then khayr, bismillah, go do what you need to do. Thank you. As opposed it, to don't do it. If you know what you're getting yourself into and you feel like, you know what, I don't have many other options right now or, you know, what else am I going to do? Maybe you fear haram. I don't know what your, your personal situation is. So long as you understand what you're getting yourself into, I'll tell you this though. We can take this conversation even more, make it even more complicated now if we are talking about bringing a stepfather into a, sit a situation or a marriage with a sister who has daughters. Mm. Okay, and to quote Will Farrell from his book, The Boy Crisis, children whom or stepfathers that are brought in to a situation, a living arrangement with a woman who has girls, those girls are 100 more times, 100, by a factor of 100 more ti uh, times more likely to be molested or uh, sexually abused in some type of way, shape or form than if they were living with their biological father. This is not something to be any just, uh, oh, it's not a big, this is major. And women know on some level of consciousness as well that, okay, if I've got a girl and she's growing up, or maybe she's a grown girl, like, we can all play like happy, happy families family. and it's his dad. No, it's not. It's not his dad. And the sisters now need to be aware of this coming into a... And again, once again, why, why have I had sisters? Because I have conversations with sisters. Why have sisters taken an affinity to the idea of no strings nikah? 
It's because a lot of them have daughters whom they are concerned about bringing another man. She might like him and so on, but aside from the fact that she likes him, she doesn't really know him from Adam, right? Mm -hmm. And she's concerned about integrating him full time into this environment with her growing daughters or maybe even her grown daughters, which is even worse, right? So then what's the solution for them? Because previously, if you have a look at my earlier content on YouTube, my position was don't marry them full stop. That's not a solution. That doesn't provide a solution for these sisters. Do you accept that was wrong? Everybody evolves their opinions over time. The, to quote, I can't remember which uh, Greek philosopher who said, if you're not embarrassed by the, by the version of yourself last year, you have not progressed fast enough. So it's an evolution over time. And even then it was rooted in certain fundamental truths that we can't hide away from and deny. The sunk cost, the sunk cost investment, for example. The fact that you will be her second priority, you will never be her first priority because she has her children to tend to. And that's going to make you feel some type of way because you are not biologically connected to them. You see, when it's your child... You can accept it. You can accept it. That's my child. It's okay. But when it's not, and we like to hide away from this discussion like it's not real. It's my child. No, bro. It's not your child. Behave yourself. Can I, let, me, let me ask you this, son, bro. You know, you know some of the things that you're talking about, they may be... They may be, not maybe, they are real underlying realities that exist mm. for those family setups. Mm. But must many of those families work out okay, my bro? More power to them, alhamdulillah. They turn out okay. So would it be fair that sometimes you're magnifying a situation worse than it really is? Well, again, to quote Will Farrell from The Boy Crisis, by a factor of 100, Dili. Mm. I don't think I'm magnifying anything here. If you had said, if you had said by a factor of two or three that child molestation cases go up when a stepfather is brought into an environment, then maybe you could. By a factor of one hundred, it's the the number one re, the number one reason why minors are sexually infringed upon is the presence of a non biological father. That's not magnifying. Okay, uh, Let's say I concede to that point, but the point about the families that make it work by the way my approach or my position to how non-muslims in western societies families f the family institution barely exists in the way it once did and the way by islamic standards meaning as an institution both family and marriage is decaying and disintegrating fast and absolutely, quick absolutely you understand absolutely the fact that there was a time where when you should call someone a bastard was an insult <laughs> you were born out of wedlock Sorry. now there's 60 or 62 percent of children now born in the uk are born out of wedlock i didn't know that yeah man. i didn't know that what? i say this because i too have a position on how the family institution and the institution of marriage is decaying and disintegrating fast and quick yeah what yeah. i'm talking about is what about them muslim households that make it work given those un sticky situation that you describe mm. given that feeling that yes when that's not your seed when it's not your child it's not the same mm. so when you marry a single mother who's now caring and looking after her children but you're not getting that love and attention it's not the same as if that was your child i accept all of that what i'm saying to you is how about those many families that just make it work they have suburb, they bite their tongue and they just... I'm an example of one of those, right? So I had, uh, I got married when I was 16. I got the second wife when I was 25. And my third wife when I was 27, okay? So by 27, you had three wives? I had three wives, yeah. I'm still with the third wife. First two went. I'm okay. still with the third wife, alhamdulillah. The third wife is a widow, okay? So her husband died. She had three children from that marriage with her husband. I'm an example of... Whoa, 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 whoa. Let's rewind there. So you married when you were 16, had the second wife at 25, and your current wife who's still with you, alhamdulillah, you married at 27. At 27, yeah. So at 27, you had three wives. Yep. As it stands now, the first two are not with you. First two are not with me. I'm with the third wife. With the third wife, the widow that you married, did she have children from the previous marriage? Three children. You're still with her? I'm still with her, of course, yeah. Wow, explain how... So, see, look, if I smoke a, a cigarettes... A pack a day, two packs a day, two packs of 40 a day for 50 years. And I don't get so much of a as a cough by the time I'm 70. And mashallah, I live to old age and I die of natural. Do I now turn around and tell people, uh, by the way, this whole thing that cigarettes causes cancer, this is all nonsense. Look at me. That's not right. Right. That's not right. So in, in my, and I don't want to say too much because I, I, I want to ward off, yani, 
I don't like people knowing my blessings in that regard, but I have complete authority, total authority with the children to the point where even sometimes, because I can be harsh and by harsh, I'm not talking about physical. I'm talking about at least I'm taking devices away and things like this, right? And even my wife says sometimes, she says, no, Matthew, sometimes you're harsh, but I'm thankful that you're here. Because actually she said to me once, I don't know what I would do without you. Because I keep them on the straight and narrow. And this is the job of the father, is to police the children before the police do. And this now, this, we can take that discussion in many different uh, angles. But most men in households where they actually have biological children don't have full authority I can't with their mothers. Children. Sorry? I can't police their children. And can't police their children. Never mind with children that are not even related to them. So I'm the guy who smokes two packs a day of cigarettes for 50 years and doesn't get cancer. But I'm not going to come out here and tell people, eh, look at me, I made it work, so can you. Why? Because that's but, a nonsensical argument. But why, why, why can't you then share the experiences that you had and the things which you utilised and implemented to make it work? It's not really about me. How it's, can... it's about my wife. Okay, so can I ask you a few questions? Mm. So you got into a marriage which you're still in which you're also kind of advising against brothers to go into, at least having caution going into. So why would it not be fair and just for you to share how it worked? Like I said, uh, what well, number one we're doing now, and number two, it's not me. I would love to sit here and tell you the reason why I, made, I, I have been able to make it work is because of me. So tell me about the other side. Then. I will. I would love to tell you it's because, you know, I've got it on point and I know how to straighten these women <laughs> and all the rest of it. The reality is, is that may Allah reward, reward my wife, I mean. is that she is extremely obedient, she is submissive and she is respectful. Those three things, that, that, that trifecta. And she makes it easy for me to raise these kids. It's not difficult for me. I also have a greater degree of compassion towards them because they are orphan children and they lost their father in a very dramatic way. So there's a greater degree of compassion there, and I have also separated widows and divorcees as well when it comes to this discussion, okay? There's a difference between divorcees and mm -hmm. widows, and we can have that discussion. But the main point here is that in this instance, the credit must go to my wife because she is the one who has made it easy for me to have full authority, and she has complete respect. Even at times, she doesn't agree with me, but she puts her head down and she's silent for, because usually I'm right anyway not being pig-headed or anything, but I am, usually I'm right. And she accepts that sometimes I make mistakes. And if I make mistakes, I own up to it. But she accepts, this is the captain of the ship. Sometimes the captain is gonna go the wrong way, no matter. Because usually the captain goes the right way. I chose this man to be my husband. I chose him to be involved with the lives of my children. I am going to allow him to captain this ship, even if he takes a wrong turn every now and again. How quickly was that established between yourselves? Immediately, yourself? straight away. But again, this is not, me this is not really my doing her, if you have a look at her mother and her father her father very dominant character her mother very respectful and passive is not a good word passive has a negative connotation but easy to lead so that was her model her model was dominant father respectful mother who is easily led by her father okay well she's the same way she's the exact same way so how can I tell brothers now, oh, brothers, I made it work, now you too. No, what I would say to you is, does the sister possess those qualities? Boom, so that's what I'm talking about. So or does she at least have the potential to, to, to conduct herself in that manner? How do you, so, so what kind of questions do you tell brothers to ask? I would say it's not really about asking her questions, although there are competency tests that you can do. You can, for example, you can see how... Um, how, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? How cooperative is she? So cooperation tests, there are some cooperation tests you can use, but the truth of the matter is, I would go one step further and say, meet the parents. Have a look at the dynamic of the parents. What's the dynamic, the relationship like between those parents? Because whatever that dynamic is, most likely that's what she has in her mind as a model moving forward with other men. Do you see? Mm -hmm. If she comes from an environment whereby mum is wearing the pants and, you know, mum's word is final and dad is just sitting there quietly and passively, then this is her idea of how a relationship should be. Now, if you have a dominant character as a man coming in, you know what's going to happen? Fireworks. Mm. Absolute nightmare. If you're a passive man and you're okay with that, which I would say to you, don't be okay with that, but whatever. If you're okay with that, then maybe it can work. But then again, we've tipped now the relationship on its head, whereby a woman is in 
is is leading the relationship and the man is following in her lead so is one of the positions that have evolved is outright not marrying divorcee women or single mothers to now consider yeah. differentiate differentiate i would say between. actually that's not even a shari compliant statement for me to say to have said or made, ha held that position to never marry single moms I, I think you know you could make an argument that's even haram because what what solution have you ever said that what have you ever said brothers stay away from divorce yeah of course i have yeah so so it is then you've yeah yeah said. yeah so uh, you can't make that argument as muslims and this is why i keep rooting this discussion back in our religion it's good so we have to provide solutions for them now one solution is what you have suggested which is, you know, well, why can't it work? Maybe it can work. All right, well, bismillah, you know, roll the dice and hope for the best. Another solution is, as I've mentioned to you, a lot of these sisters, by the way, who have been uh, married a number of times, two plus times, they are the ones who are reluctant to get into a third, fourth, fifth marriage on a full-time basis. The idea, and this is where men and women differ, we have different mindsets to this, the idea for a woman who has already been in a full-time marriage two, three, four times, to then do it again with another man, long. it's long, bro. You know what I had one sister say to me? She said to me, Mahdi, I just want to meet a brother. I'm quoting you verbatim. I just want to meet a brother in a hotel once or twice a week. We do as man and woman do, and we go our separate ways after that. Why? She's a full-time mother to a number of children, and she also has another thing going on. I'm trying to keep the details light so that this woman's mm -hmm, sister mm -hmm. can't be identified, mm -hmm. okay? Full-time mother, number of children, been married a number of times before. It's all long, bruv, trying to do it again in her mind. This is what she wants. Now, I already know what the response will be from the audience, which is, oh yeah, well, women say that, but she'll change her mind along the way. I was literally going to say that. But I've dealt with cases, I've seen cases and heard cases where a misyar arrangement starts. Come check for me two, three times. Come check for me two, three times a month. Mm -hmm. No financial commitment. I don't have to cook and clean for you. Just come link me. Yep. We have our intimate moments. And then one, two months later, the expectation increases. Yep. Uh, all of a sudden now, there's talks of things that were not agreed upon to begin with. I've seen this myself. Very good. Men marry women hoping she will never change women marry men hoping he will change you are 100 percent correct you hit the nail on the head she will expect or come to expect more from him as the marriage progresses even if she doesn't acknowledge it in that moment she's probably she might not even be thinking it she may be thinking yeah you know what i'm happy with this just once or twice a week this is convenient for me trust and believe by the time her emotions get involved she's going to want more and i will say this most no strings nikah arrangements will fail they will fail okay and i'll explain to you if you're saying that then how can you be pushing no strings nikah okay very good you're going to get to a point in the marriage with a no strings nikah type of marriage whereby she's going to want more from you and it is her shari right by the way to request those rights back. She has voluntarily forsaken them. She has the right to be able to Absolutely. retract them Absolutely. whenever she wants to. So you're not in a position of leverage as a man. At that moment, you come to a crossroads whereby you now must make a decision as a man. Either you take her on as a full-time wife and you make it like a conventional marriage, or you say, you know what, sister, it's not for me. If you want to continue with this arrangement, we can. If you don't want to continue with this arrangement, we're going to have to go our separate ways. And and the vast majority, in my estimation, of no strings nikah mar uh, marriages will fail. Why do I say that with my chest? It's because it's better than zina, bro. And this is the bottom line. And this is where we can actually draw our brother Muhammad Hijab into the conversation because it was Muhammad Hijab who actually instilled a seed in a conversation I had with him offline that went into gestation in my mind by asking me one simple question. And he said to me, Mahdi, what is the overarching concern of the religion with regards to marriages? And I said to him, preservation of the nuclear home, right? He said to me, no. The overarching concern of the religion with regards to marriage is protecting the private parts. Now, he doesn't know it and he didn't know it and I didn't know it then, but that went into gestation in my mind and I started thinking, right. So if the overarching concern is not preservation of the nuclear home, although this is very important, by the way, is protection of the private parts, then no strings nikah is a bad solution to a worse problem. Bro, yeah, let's, let's, let's talk. 
I had a conversation with a sister the other day. She was doing the dumbest zina. It was dumb zina. I was like, why are you doing that? She said to me, look, she wanted to find out more about No Shrines Dikash. She said to me, I'm not going to lie to you. For the past few years, I've been committing zina with my ex-husband. Bro, what's the point in that? Why didn't you just marry him again? Oh, you know what she said? I didn't want to marry him. You know, the whole thought of getting into a full-time marriage and him coming back and living full-time, I didn't want that. But I thought if I'm going to commit zina, better for it to be with my ex-husband than for it to be with a stranger. Did she think she was committing a lesser of a sin or something? Yeah. That's mad. Ajib gharib. That's mad. But if this sister knew, and this is where now the halal has become, the uh, haram has, the halal has become hard and the haram has become easy if she was presented with this idea that there is a way whereby she can do a no strings nikah and she can engage with her ex-husband in halal without having to integrate him full time back into her life because that was what put that was what put her off doing nikah right doing a conventional marriage then then she wouldn't have fallen into this trap she wouldn't have fallen into zina and that's why I say is that's dumb zina. That's, that's not even like there's no smart zina, but that's dumb zina. Let me. So you know, no strings nikah. I can't help but think of no strings attached relationships, no strings attached friendships. Just means from a Western non-Muslim point of view, as soon as you hear no strings attached anything re linked to relationships, yeah, it just means uh, intimacy on tap, right? Or as and when there's no commitment. Mm. That's essentially what it is. It's no commitment, yep. right? Now, the institution of nikah, the, 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 the marriage, the institution of marriage is something that is so sacrilegious and so sacred mm. in our deen. Mm. It is to the extent where Allah dedicates aspects of his book to address these issues, right? So I guess what I'm asking you is, or what I'm trying to say is that on the one hand, we're trying to prevent zina, if we were to accept that no strings nikah is a solution to address this issue where you've got divorcee women who've been married two or three times don't want to commit anymore and so forth but then it kind of becomes like i, I can't help but what, 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 do, what do the what do the shia practice I forgot what they call it. It, it becomes like well some of the well, like, like a muta kind of thing like mm. I, I, i'm on it now i want a no strings nikah not on it anymore it could even be like i don't actually like this guy i want to maybe i'll do something for so he divorces me so i can go for the next man sure is there not a danger of it of, of of kind of proliferating that kind of culture absolutely and this is why a lot of the many of the ulama say it's uh they, they dislike it it's not recommended yeah misyad is not it's, it's not something that's and i agree i don't recommend it either it's a bad solution to a worse problem dili and the worst problem here is the overarching concern of the sharia to bring it back to muhammad hijab which is protection of the private parts now if and this is how we will fetter this issue okay mm -hmm. because you you've touched upon a very important point which is surely this is something that could be exploited yani, easily 100 percent agree with you by themselves by, by, themselves, by, by, yeah. by, by the people themselves by the brothers by the sisters Certain people have bigger appetites than others, and then they will start now misappropriating and misusing this exemption that the Sharia provides. This is very simple to fix. This is a very simple fix. I'll tell you this. If a sister chooses to not involve her wali, okay, we're going to have a massive problem on our hands. If she tries to choose to bypass her wali or ignore him or whatever, we're going to have a massive problem. So long as she sticks with her wali and her wali is involved at all stages, okay, this problem will not happen because he will be her sieve, her net to do the vetting of the brother on her behalf. Now, a lot of walis are not going to want to be involved with this, okay? I've actually spoken to a wali myself with one wali that I was, for, for a sister that I was considering. And I, I, I spoke with the sister once. When and you I say wali, are you actually dealing with the fathers and brothers? The brother, the father... Uh, the brother but well, you're dealing um, with fathers and brothers yeah fathers and brothers okay in this instance the father is not in the picture anymore okay. he passed away I, mean. I said to the sister we spoke and i said to her okay alhamdulillah it seems like there could be something here i said you do know by the way that uh, number one i don't take the hanafi school of thought that a woman who's been married before can marry again without her wali right so i don't take that yeah. and al although i know i understand it's a respected opinion i said number two you said you do know i will go straight to your family 
And she got like a bit shook. Like, no, no, no. I said to her, listen, if I'm, if I'm not involved in your brothers, I'm not involved, period. Right? This is how it's going to be. She accepted. I called up her brother straight away. I spoke to her brother. I said, yo, are you doing, bro? We're saying, you know, how's everything? Blah, blah, blah. And I said to him, uh, you know, what's your, your take on this? And I said to him, before I asked him, I said to him, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to ask your permission for something. And if you say no, despite my, my feeling towards this sister, I will accept it and I will walk away. And I'm not going to try and bypass you, even if your reason for no is not Sharia compliant. Because I know I could bypass the wali, but that just gets all long and messy. I don't want to deal with that. Mm -hmm. Okay. He said to me, you know what, Mahdi? I don't want to deal with this. But if you want to do this, it's fine. I, I give up my wali ship to next man and you deal with it from there. I just don't want to be involved, which I perfectly understand. If I was a brother and of, of, the, of this sister and next man is saying, yo, bro, I want to marry your sister and no strings in the car, I'm going to feel some type of way. Of course you are. You're going to feel some, we're human beings at the end of the day. But I respected his response and he didn't get in the way and he didn't say no. What's my point to bring it right back around is, so long as you stick with your wali to the best of your ability, okay? as a sister that is, you're not gonna have any problems. The moment you allow a man to sprinkle some, some sugar and spice on you and win you with his words and then you do it all secret and low key and all the rest of it, then you're gonna have problems. But Dili, guess what? That's happening anyway, bro. No strings or not. That's happening anyway. You know, whilst you're saying all of this, right? I can't help but find myself agreeing with some of the things that you're saying and the points that you're making because I've observed these things myself. Mm. I guess my concern and that of some or many of our viewers and listeners would be fine. So we have an issue of divorcee women, multiple, multiple divorcee women, and by multiple, I mean women that have been divorced multiple times. Mm. Uh, some of them are mothers, have children. Um, they don't want to commit to a marriage uh, in the conventional sense. So we have no strings nikah in place to prevent zina and to prevent and to protect the private parts. Mm. Yeah, I'm still struggling with, and maybe you can help me unstruggle with this. Is that with something like no strings nikah being a solution, or as you say, a bad solution to an even worse problem, or a bad solution to a clear cut haram problem? Hey, well. Private parts still become a thing, innit? It'll, 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 it'll. How do you contain that? Who regulates that? Who polices that? Who wally, bro. Wally. You need your wally. And I speak, to, I speak to the sisters directly. You need your wally involved every step of the way. And now I speak to the wallies as well. To the wallies, I say to you, you need to open your minds a little bit. Even if it's just for a regular conventional marriage, too many brothers, fathers or brothers, are turning brothers away on grounds that are just not reasonable they are not reasonable grounds what do you think she's gonna do you made it hard for her and when you make the halal hard guess what the haram becomes easy um no strings nikah is this something that you started yes uh it's a website at the moment it's we have a website we're on so all social media platforms but it's mainly telegram okay. for the moment but i'm actually working with app developers to develop the app the beta version of the app inshallah tab. okay so we're on all social media platforms, but Telegram is where we're most active. Okay. Um, in terms of language, the way you deliver your content, your views, the way you articulate yourself, um, is language like body count and getting beat and these kind of things referring mm. to obviously the number of men that uh, women have, uh, have intercourse with or slept with or beat referring to intercourse. Mm. Uh, is that kind of language... Uh, something you purposely utilize or is it just part of your lingo? It's part of my lingo. Yeah. Do you find it crass and crude from an Islamic point of view? No. No? <laughs> no. Okay, that's interesting. Have you had others convey to you that it's crass and crude? <sighs> yeah, yourself, for, okay. for example. So we have a body count. Yeah. In a convention. Yeah, what's wrong with body count? Okay, let me, let me explain to you why. Yeah. yeah. There's reality and then there's environment. Mm. We are subjects of an environment and we have various realities that shape and mould the way we think and operate and perceive good and bad, right and wrong and so forth. So in the context of the 21st century, when we talk about body count, right, growing up in British state schools mm. and maybe not in the most Islamic environments, it just means how many people you slept with. Right. Right. 
when you utilize that language that has a certain connotation to it to now in the context of marriage something which is sacred mm. beautiful pure islamically sanctioned sanctioned by god and that terminology is now used for that mm. it becomes an issue why tell me why because body count as the term as the asal root of that term yeah. the coinage of that term is nearly always referred to sexual promiscuity zina and how many sexual partners generally men have had but yeah. also women and women don't yeah. say yeah how many sexual encounters you've had yeah, yeah. so what's the difference the difference <laughs> no hold on the, di the difference yeah. is that in the context in which it was rooted and founded was zina it was never in in the context or in, in, in understood in the context of marriage mm. okay. because let me give an example if a man if if a man slept with multiple women mm. outside of wedlock He's a harami. <laughs> he's a harami. He's yeah. a straight up harami. He yeah. knows it. If he's a Muslim, he knows he's a harami and he best be repenting. Because he knows he can't be chest tight talking about body count outside of wedlock. Mm. You can't with your boys at the gym or with your non Muslim friends or with your jahil friends. Yeah, you can get away with that. But in reality, you know that, let's say, if the same brother, for whatever reason, had, was married and divorced to seven women, so in his lifetime, he had seven wives, yeah. married, divorced, stayed with some of them, seven, eight, nine. It's not the same, bro. Because that is, could be the mother of your children. There was a nikah. I think this is semantics, Dilly. Nah, Habib. Nah. Yeah, I think it's semantics, nah, bro. Nah, it's not, B. I'll tell you why. And maybe we can, we can as brothers, disagree on this, or yeah. the, agree to disagree on this. Beat, body count. This, this, <laughs> this kind of terminology, it's used in a particular environment. I've got you. Because... Okay, let me ask you this then. I don't know from Algeria to Bangladesh and you man are Maghreb as in West and we are East, <laughs> right? Yeah. I know that even the most like kind of like, what's the word I'm looking for? Even the kind of most alpha male stud muffin kind of brother from these countries yeah. that are from the rural areas, I don't think they'll have a terminology for, 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 for body count and stuff like this. What do you mean? Meaning they won't refer to sexual encounters outside of wedlock mm. right and then our men from our countries from our lands from the muslim lands i don't think they'll have terminologies like i understand this. what you're saying because I, your I, I guess what i'm stressing is the the the, the, the sacredness of marriage mm. that a sister could have a body count of seven men so what would you say what would you call it how many husbands <sighs> that sounds worse bro why, bro? You know that sounds worse. How? I'll tell you why. <clears throat> women always downplay. Okay, let's let's talk about non-Muslim women now. Let's take this outside of Islam. A woman who is used to sexual encounters will always downplay how many men she has had encounters with. Yes. Always, right? But when you say I've had five husbands, it sounds dead, Dilly. It sounds proper dead. Shall I tell you why it sounds dead to the Western woman? Yeah. Because the Western woman does not desire marriage in the way her grandmother's was. I got did. you. And I know it was in halal. And I know, you know, and alhamdulillah, you know, the sharia, wallahi, Islam is a practical religion at the end of the day. Yeah. It really does. You had 10 husbands, okay, it was in halal, it was in halal. Whether you call it husbands or body count, it's all the same for me. And you're cool with language like beat. For me, there's no issue with it at all. You can carry on with that. At least reflect upon it. I will think about For it. For me. I will think about it. For me. Do you at least agree, before we move on to the conclusion, concluding points of the podcast, do you at least accept that the terminologies of body count and beat <coughs> and these kind of things, they exist in a particular environment, which is the UK, Western, non-Muslim reality of having relationships outside yeah. of wedlock? Yeah, I accept that. That's all. That's <coughs> what happened. I got you. So all I'm saying is, so now to now forklift that, and to now place it into the beauty of an Islamic marriage. Yeah, I, 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 this is still semantics for me, but I, I accept your premise. Let's now talk about um, a recent post. Mm. <laughs> Let's read it out. This was a post that you posted uh, last week. N which one? The one that went viral on Twitter? The one, the That's one like about two and a half months old, bro. Well, the one about my wife goes into labor. Yeah, it's old. Ross, how come he's doing the rounds Someone now? Someone picked it up, put it on Twitter, the algorithm did all the rest of the work. Do you mind if I read it out? Of course. <clears throat> My wife goes into labor immediately after Fajr. I told her, great, I'm going to bed. Wake me up when it's done. I refuse to sit on labors. It is not 
uh, capitalized not. A man's place, and never was, even in Britain, up until the feminist revolution. Why would I want to see my wife in that state? How am I meant to sleep with her again after witnessing that traumatic nightmare? She understood, of course. Better still, she agrees. Two hours later, she comes upstairs with the baby, home birth, and wakes me up to a beautiful new addition to our family. Mabrook, akhi. P.S. The midwives didn't even make it in time. She handled that business on her own like a real boss babe. And it's just very recently gone viral mm. uh, with uh, very prominent Instagram accounts uh, sharing it in their stories, asking what people's thoughts are. How many comments is there? About 4,000 plus? Yeah, more, than, more than I have followers. Okay. <laughs> um, can, I, can I go through with the statement with you? Yes, of course, yeah. Okay. So we're both recent fathers. Uh, mm-hmm. We both had daughters, alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen. And um, labor is a conversation which I've had with some brothers. Um, it's a conversation that I've had with Muslim men. And there's various camps. There's the camp that believe, yani, it's just the norm. I have to be there. Meaning there's no other <laughs> alternative. Yeah. If it's not me, then who the hell is it? Yeah. <laughs> then you got the brothers and they are the minority. Like I'm not sitting into labor. It's not happening. Not not in a thousand years. It's not happening. Where she has a mother, a sister, my mother, oh a mother a mother in law, I I'm not doing it. Mm. Yeah. And then you get those in between that do it out of mushkila, do it against their will, against their choice. Um for some of the reasons that you've mentioned, right? So you know, can I ask you something? Yes. Just here. My wife goes into labor immediately after Fajr, alhamdulillah. I told her, great, I'm going to bed. Wake me up when it's done. Is that really what went down? Yeah. All of it? Of course. What happened if something went wrong, bro? Then what? she'll call me. What happened if there's like major blood loss, bro, and she can't call out to you? Habib? All right, let me, let me give it some more context. I feel like I haven't given it enough context. And so, what, the, what the maddest thing is, yeah. just last week, there was research published, right? Uh, I'll send it to you and I'll, I'll put it at the bottom of the video. Where BAME women, specifically the Channel 4 highlighted Muslim women, mm. have the most complications at birth in British hospitals. Now, mm. the context is hospitals yeah. and this is home birth. I get it. But what would you have done? I'll give it more context. I'll give it more context. So, first and foremost, the midwives have been called. Okay. Okay. The front door was open. Okay. So, the front door had been left open. After that, after I went upstairs, it was a matter of uh, minutes before the midwives, midwives had arrived. After that, my wife is used to very quick labors. Okay. They, they come out fast. In fact, we decided to stop going to the hospital when she gave birth to uh, Yusuf in the hallway of the hospital. She, we, she was walking. I didn't even make it on time, by the way. I didn't even make it. She was walking. Did you try and She make was it on holding time? the nurse's her arm and she said, I, I'm not going to make it to the ward. I need to do it right now. I need to give birth right now. And she dropped down in the middle of the hall and the baby came out then and there. Right there. After that experience, she said, Mahdi, never again. Home birth and that's it. I said to her, excellent. So much the better. Okay. So door was open, midwives have been called and her older daughters were also upstairs and aware of the situation anyways. So I had already had my contingencies in place. I, I love my wife. I'm not going to put her in a situation so where Yanni, I... So why didn't you include that in the poll? Because it went, it went viral. Come on, bro. <laughs> People are thinking, raw. you left her on her Jack Jones. Mm. But she had her daughters there. Well, they weren't there there. As in, the, the, they were upstairs. If, if by some freak of nature accident something. And anyway, I was in the house, Yanni. A quick call... I'm, I'm there, I'm sleeping in the bedroom. Just carry on. more context. I'm what? a light sleeper. Okay. You know, so yeah. look, look, I told you, women especially, they're bored, bro. They need a reason to be so angry. So, why are you paying into their boredom for? You like it? You know, this post, by the way. Do you like winding there are this t- up? There are times, I'll answer that. <laughs> there are times when I am uh, intentionally obnoxious. Okay. okay. With how I write my post. That was not one of them. That was really me just writing. Yeah, I just wanted to write. But sometimes I am intentionally obnoxious. Why? Look, social media is a game of attention. Okay? Yes. So some people say to me, oh, Mehdi, you're a clout chaser. I say, yeah, of course I'm a clout chaser. Absolutely, I'm a clout chaser. Anyone who is creating content on social media... Is an element of clout chasing. Nobody created a video and said, you know what? I hope it only gets one view. I hope nobody shares it. Everyone's clout chasing. 
Okay, why? Because I have a more important message that I want to share. And human beings in this day and age, our attention span is so small and so fleeting, it's very hard, as you know, you're in the social media game, it's very hard to get the attention of people. So sometimes you've got to throw a bone out that you know the people are gonna latch on to. And even me telling you this, and the people hearing this, they'll still, for, they'll still do it over and over again because there are more important messages that I want to share with the people and that, that can be found on my channel in, on the long form content that I have on my, on my page, on my so, channel. So We wouldn't even be talking right now about this if I hadn't written it like that. 100%, you're absolutely right. I would not have clicked onto your videos if you didn't word the titles the way they did. But back to this, yeah? So the doors were open, the midwives have been called. Been called. And her daughters were around. They were around. Okay. I refuse to sit on labours. I don't, I don't think that, I personally don't feel that requires elaboration. Um, no, I think it does because why? I think a lot of women that didn't like that statement. They didn't like it at all. I mean, to the sisters who say, oh, you're just objectifying us again. I say, yes, we have objectified you. You are an object. We see, you know, scientists have already hooked up electrodes to the brain. When men see women, the areas of the brain that light up when we see a woman are the same areas of the brain that light up when we see objects like a hammer or a tool or a, you know, you name it. We see women as the sum of their parts before their whole first. So yes, we do objectify, objectify women. Furthermore, women want to be objectified. Why do they beautify themselves in the first place? Don't lie to me, sister, and say to me, oh, I always look like this at home when nobody's around. Come on, sister, don't lie, Yanni. It's okay, you can be honest. The pictures you have on social media, and mashallah, your DP, your, your done up and all the rest of it. You want to be objectified. And this is where, subhanAllah, a uh, woman was created from the rib of Adam. She was created from Adam, for Adam, because he was lonely. She wants to, him to be happy with her and wh in whatever shape or form that means. And part of that mm -hmm. is in appreciating her beauty. Now, there is another element that is disconnected from the visual dilly, and that is the emotional side. Of course. On a scale of one to, ten, one to ten, how, in your estimation, how useful are men when it comes to empathy? and you know empathic consideration from purely a non-statistical point of view yes non-statistical uh, not much <laughs> not, not, not very good right no, not great. in that moment the one thing a woman needs the most is that emotional support but they say they need their men though they think they need their men what she needs is that emotional support and men are frankly useless in this regard when it comes to this emotional support you know because i i sat in on five of, of my first wife's labors five of them i was young what did i i didn't know any different Bro, wallahi al-azim, because she would always give birth in the middle of the night. I would sleep in between contractions. And then when she's having a contraction, because I'm, I'm exhausted. And then when she's having a contraction, I'm like, oh, it's okay, have it you, you're okay. You're all right. And I'm straight back to sleep again. And useless. What's your view on those sisters that say that, look, we don't want our mothers seeing the Mary's Eva? It doesn't have to be her mother. It can be a friend. It can be a sister. And by the way, they don't even have to see. I never seen anything. I've been on five labors, I refuse to see. I've never seen anything. I stay at the head of the bed. That's where I stayed, right? They don't have to see. In fact, she needs to be there holding her hand, talking in her ear, giving her that support. That's it. And women are much better than that than men. So I refuse to sit on labors. I don't think that, okay, fine, we, we would need to. It is not a man's place and never was even in Britain up until the French Revolution, truth to that. Why would I want to see my wife in that state? How am I meant to sleep with her again after witnessing that traumatic nightmare? So let's, let's just look at some of the language on that one. How am I meant to sleep with her again after witnessing that traumatic nightmare? I mean, <laughs> is, 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 it, is it? Some men are more queasy than others. I'm not a very queasy man, but when I wrote that post, I, know, I wrote that knowing that there are men who are Yani, extremely, extremely queasy. And it's not just the sight, by the way, it's the sound and the smell, okay? Sometimes in the mid, whilst the woman is in the middle of her contraction or she's told to push, she actually pushes out poop, hashek, right? Or maybe she even urinates a little bit. And then there's all sorts of a concoction of smells and all sorts going on. For a lot of men, this is very difficult, a very difficult experience to overcome six weeks, two months, three months later when she's finished her postnatal bleeding and so on and then wants to be intimate with her again. That's the only thing he's got on his mind. 
It's the only thing he has in his mind. So I'd say to the sister, Yani, this is all of this is in your interest. I'm not trying to oppress you or upset you. This is in your interest. You want your husband to still be attracted to you, sir. This is Yani one method that we can preserve his your image in his mind. Uh, call me not old fashioned, bro, because old fashioned would mean men not necessarily being in labor and that. But I'm saying, what happened to the Good old old fashioned of just making things work the way they are, bro. How do you mean? Like, I'm talking about the amalgamation of all the things that we've spoken about today. The not being able to discipline a child that's not yours. Mm. Uh, always being feeling inferior to an alpha widow who subconsciously or consciously is comparing you or treating you or dealing with you compared to the first man that she had. Mm. Um, Marrying women, uh, sisters with children, especially daughters, being in labor with your wife. It's worked for the last 40, 50 years, and we've not had an endemic of divorces and family breakdowns. Why can't you not just carry on that way, Mahdi? It's everything that you have just mentioned. Yeah, why can't you not just carry? Why, why can't you just continue? Because grit, the, bite your tongue, let it happen for the greater maslaha of the family. Is it though? Could be, bro. Is it? Could be. The wheels are falling off, Dilly. The wheels are falling off. Just because the wheels are still on doesn't mean they're not falling off. In all of these different discussion points you have just mentioned, the wheels are falling off. It's the very, very reason we are sat here having this discussion in the first place. 60% of all high school dropouts come from single mothers single mother homes statistically proven that statistically one. proven 70 90 percent i'm sorry 90 percent of all youth self deletions to keep it youtube friendly come from single mother homes now single moms will hear this and become enraged infuriated what are you trying to say we're not doing a good i know you're trying your best you're doing your best to raise your, raise your child and with the the resources you have available to you and so on but there is a certain something that a woman doesn't have when it comes to policing her child and that word that thing is can be summarized in one word which is authority you can be a good woman a god-fearing woman but when a woman, when a child hears a woman's voice and hears a man's voice, it's just a different sound. I'm sure you can relate to 100%. growing up. The other side to that coin is that women are more likely to capitulate on boundary enforcement than men are. You see, because she feels bad. She's in touch with her emotions more. She doesn't like the fact that the child feels sad now because he has to go to bed at 7 p.m., can't have another drink, fill in the blank, whatever the case may be. Whereas men, we tend to detach our emotions more from doing what we, we believe to be right so it's less of you are deficient or because this is how a lot of women interpret this and more of this is just not your forte you have a forte this one is not it um just to wrap up on the the post yeah so the doors were open your wife had her daughters around available um so you are actually more available than perhaps you it appears from the post. Yeah. I mean, there was, there was never a moment when she was in danger because that's the existential fear here is that it is. Yeah. The existential fear is, and the reason why it was so triggering is that Mahdi irresponsibly put his wife in danger. There was never a moment when she was in danger. That's I, I, I that's the clarification that people wanted, I guess. I, something else um, I wanted to ask you um, The status of a woman in labour hmm. And the status that Islam has given to the woman in labour That's not something which you question or, No, no, of course not The fact that if she dies, she, she dies that of a martyr Yes, yes, absolutely Or that when Abdullah ibn Omar was asked um, I've done tawaf with my mother on my back Have I repaid her? And he goes, you haven't repaid her for a single pang of pregnancy Absolutely, absolutely um, These are not things which you're disputing at all <laughs> No, I don't, we don't deny or reject any of these things This is not, yeah, it's not a discussion So bringing the podcast to a close We've established that You are not saying yay or nay conclusively to brothers to not marry divorcee women or women who have been multiple. secondary option secondary option right uh, and that even though you your setup has worked 
you still feel that that doesn't put you in a position to now advocate for making it work all the time. I'm the guy who smoked two packs of cigarettes a day for 50 years and didn't get so much as a cough. Okay. Um, you've also mentioned that the no strings nikah isn't a isn't is an unideal solution, but one that the religion allows for a far worse situation, which is zina. Bad solution to a worse problem. Okay. Um, so bringing the podcast to a close, I want to ask you, my dear brother. Mm. Um, throughout your life, um, if you don't mind me asking, how many marriages have you had? Three. Three. Um, without necessarily going into details, and again, you can say no comment because no one needs to profess their sins or, or life of jahiliya. Yeah. Um, do you have relationships before? I got married too young for that, bro. Oh yes, yeah. subhanAllah, that's true. <laughs> um, you know, I'll tell you a short story. I got, the night before I got married, because I got married at 16, the night before I Why got, did you get married at age 16? That's really I young. Fe I fell in love. And you married her? Yeah. I was, How long did that marriage and last? I think this, because my dad always instilled in me from young, Mahdi, you're going to get married in Salah, so I'm going to marry you off, always like jokingly. So then when I met this girl in college, college and she was wearing hijab and abaya, even though I wasn't practicing, I was like, you know what? I can't mess around with her. There's something I knew. I was like, you can't mess around with a girl who wears hijab and abaya. So I met her two weeks later. I said, you know what? How old was she? Same age, first year of college. I said, I want to marry you. So I'm going to go, I'm, you tell your dad, I'm going to tell my dad. I told my dad on Eid morning, he was fast asleep. I woke him up, I said to him, Whilst he's still asleep, I said, Baba, uh, there's a girl, I met her in college. Uh, I want to marry her and her dad wants to meet you today in the masjid. And the, re the rest is history. So from the night that we got married, it's like subhanAllah, Allah muqallib al-qulub, the turn of the hearts. From that, I wasn't praying up until then. That night, I never missed the salah. You know, so, never missed the salah. So I started practicing the religion, you could say, from the age of 16. So I never really had that opportunity, if you want to call it Allah that. Allah protected you. Alhamdulillah, that. Allah protected me, yeah. How long did that marriage last? Oof, nearly 12 years. Nearly 12 years. Um, were you heartbroken when it ended? Were you sad? I stayed in that marriage towards the end for the sake of our children. And what, what really upset me was that Okay, let me give you a bit more background. My father, growing up, he went through, my, my mother was very ill for a long time. And what I saw with his perseverance in towards keeping that marriage together must have somehow ingrained itself in my mind. And, I, and seeing his example, which is no matter how tough it gets, you make this work for the sake of the kids. So I took that mentality on board with the children. It got to a point in the marriage between me and my, my first wife whereby we weren't seeing eye to eye on anything, but I said to her, look, I'm not here for you. I'm here for the children. I know you don't like me and so on and so forth. That's okay. We have responsibility. That responsibility is the children. So when she eventually got her khul, her khul was granted. What, up, what hurt me the most was the fact that my children would no longer grow, grow up in an environment whereby their father was around full time. Her, I had made peace with the fact that she didn't want to be, and that was fine. It was the children that affected me the most. And to this day, this is still something that hurts me. Not being able to be in the lives of my children in the way that I would like to be, you know. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala improve that situation for you, my bro. I mean, And all I the mean. fathers who are not being able to perhaps be a part of the children's lives as a result of divorces and bitter separations. I mean, um, I mean your second marriage, uh, how long did that last? Four years. And the third marriage is the sister who's a widow with children who you've recently had uh, a beautiful baby daughter. With. Yes, alhamdulillah. alhamdulillah. Yeah. Um, have you ever been heartbroken in your life? See, this question is asked a lot. And this is how I answer this question. I mean, has a woman ever done you? I'll answer the question. When people ask, you see, when people see behavior, whether it's online or in real life, that doesn't make sense with their worldview or their perceptions, the human psyche needs to find reasons as to why things are the way they are. So people immediately jump to conclusions. For example, with this most recent Twitter post that went viral, oh, he must be gay. Or he must, who hurt you? I've got tons of messages like this, right? So we are wired to want to find explanations and reasons as to why things are the way they are. And my response is this. Whether I have been hurt before or not been hurt before is not relevant because in answering this question, whether I, if I say yes, I have, people go, ah, 
That's why he thinks the way he does. I no longer need to think anymore. It doesn't matter what he says, he's been hurt. And if I say no, people will say he's lying. It's not true. So this is a lose-lose question. So my response is, to this question always is the same response, which is, this question is not important for the reason I have just stated. What's important is, look at what you see me saying and judge it for what it is, not for whether I have or haven't been hurt before. It's not relevant. Can I posit to you why perhaps it could be relevant? Of course, Father. <clears throat> Life experiences, my brother, primary socialization, secondary socialization, these are sociological terms of when a child grows up into kid adulthood and then adulthood and so forth, right? Life experiences, things which you've highlighted yourself, the absence of a father, the presence of a father, the presence of a weak, meager father, mm. a meek father, a very assertive father, the absence of it, the presence of it, all these things shape, you literally just said that your father, may Allah bless him, I mean, his perseverance when, when your mother was unwell, instilled within you, whether you know it or not, or whether it is that or not, mm. the sacrifice for making a family work for the sake of children. So why can that same principle and reality not apply to experiences that you may or may not have had with women that have now shaped your views? Because in answering this question, as I mentioned to you, is that it's not a question that provides us with more insight and clarity. It's a question that will provide the lazy with the reason that they are already looking for, an easy reason. And that's specifically to do with you? It's to do with me and the things that... So I say, this is why I don't answer this question, because it's lose, lose. Yes, lose. No, lose. Then we don't... Have, there's no point, you know? There's no point in, in, in having the discussion in the first place. It doesn't provide us with any further insight or clarity into the things that we are speaking of. To conclude, can we at least agree on that life experiences, which it could include trauma and happiness, shape and mould the way people grow up to become? Yes, and I'll take that a step further. Robert Greene, he talks about in his book, The Laws of Human Nature, how people often define themselves in reverse of the experience that they have had. So for example, you grow up with a very strict parent, uh, the, you, your, your immediate reaction is, I'm going to let my kids do whatever they want. Okay? Because you feel so suffocated that you say, you know what? My kids are going to be able to do whatever they want to do. Or you just, you just think, of, I can't think of another example off the top of my head. But the point here is that oftentimes, and children do this a lot, they look at their parents and they say, you know what? I never want to be like my mum, dad, fill in the blank. I'm going to be the exact opposite of them. And Who Rob does that, bro? If the experience is quite extreme, then you are going to be inclined towards running away from it as much as possible. And the example I gave was a claustrophobic, super strict uh, yeah, childhood, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? So you want, you want to break free and free them. It's a, it's a natural reaction. The mistake that a lot of people make is defining themselves in reverse of the experience that they have been exposed to. You are still defining yourself by that experience. So you might think, oh, I'm nothing like my dad. No, you are exactly like him. In reverse. You are exactly like your mum. In reverse. So now you have used that, that benchmark and decided, and, and that benchmark is still dictating your life's actions into the future, just in reverse. So you think you're far away from it, but not realizing actually that is the, the standard that you have chosen. And now everything you're doing is in reverse to that standard, but it's still based upon that standard. I, <laughs> what are we to expect? Any f more kind of content from you, bro? Yes, yes, I have um, uh, quite a few things lined up. Uh, Alhamdulillah, the channel is growing. I'm going to be on another individual's podcast that I'm not going to let name, name, but sh sh the individual has quite a, a big channel. So, uh, because I don't want people reaching out to her and all the rest of it. Uh, that will be in the coming weeks, inshallah ta'ala. But um, if the people want to find me, Mahdi Tijani on YouTube, okay. uh, and then everywhere else, at the Mahdi Tijani. So there's another podcast coming up with a sister. It's not a sister, no. You said her. Okay, non-Muslim. Okay. Non-Muslim. Yeah. Okay, interesting. Non -Muslim. Interesting. Exactly. Interesting. Okay, I see. Middle. I would like the people to let us know in the comments actually what topics do they wish that we should have covered. Absolutely, do that, brothers and sisters who have watched this podcast. If you found some of the topics uh, controversial, interesting, normal, um, say, it. and if there's things which you want Mahdi to discuss. Let us know if there's things which you feel that I should have probed him more on. Let us know. But before you do that, make sure you subscribe to the Five Pillars YouTube channel and to all our platforms on the major audio platforms. 
And until next time, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Blood Brothers Podcast, a five-headed production.